All right. So there's some older videos out there for manipulating strings. You're welcome to follow up with those. Um, the big deal with manipulating strings is this is our way of actually being able to test data, massage data, um, particularly for you guys that are looking to, quote, sanitize the information or validate information. That's what this section's all about. So from here on out and in, in future weeks, you should be able to sanitize any inputs that come in from any user, make sure it's exactly what you're looking for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the past, you could have done that a little bit with some try and accept and some other stuff, and it was kind of lengthy to do that. This is going to make it a whole lot of one-liners to make it really simple for you to be able to test whether it's what you want it to be. So when we look with strings, um, the first section that's going to talk about here is string literals. This is something that I actually introduced back in like week one or two. You guys should be familiar with that. The idea is, is that you can't use a single quotes around a string if you had an apostrophe out in the middle of it. So to get around that, you just use double quotes, all right? And I introduced that early on as opposed to here because you guys have ran into that several times already. So use double quotes in order to avoid having to do the single quote stuff when you have apostrophes. Um, it's not a bad idea just to write everything in double quotes if you think about it, but it doesn't matter one way or the other. Okay. You could also use escape characters if you need to. So if you end up needing to use both single quotes and double quotes, you're going to have to end up using escape characters to escape the values that are inside of there. So an example of that would be something like this, where you have say hi to Bob's mother. You could use single quotes on the outside. You just use a backslash character in front of this one, and it will escape this single quote, meaning it will not execute it as code. Okay. There's a couple known escape characters. So for example, the single quote, the double quote, these are ones that are more pertinent. So a slash T actually adds a tab inside there. So it'd be like you guys hitting tab in Microsoft Word or something. Same way here. So if you guys are printing out a long list and you say slash T item, colon, slash T name, colon, slash T age, colon, it will actually tab and format that. So when you print it down, it's all in a nice clean row. All right. Um, you could do that a little bit more with center and things like that that we learned in the past, but tabs will make sure it's nice and tabbed going across there. Uh, slash in is your new line character or a line break. This is just going to add a new line right at the end of it so that it moves on. Note that your print statement, you guys learned this early on, that if I just do a print with brackets and nothing inside of it, that essentially has a slash in inside of there, right? Because end equals slash in by default. So it's basically printing a new line character every time. If you want to print multiple new lines in the string that you have, throw in some slash ins and it will go ahead and add lines inside of there. Okay. And then of course, if you have a backslash in your, your string and you need to escape that, you just use a double backslash there. All right. So they're going to have a couple examples here. An easier way to do some of that is what's called a raw string. And so a raw string, you just put the letter R in front of it. And what that will do is escape anything inside of there. So like, for example, here, you'll get the actual slash printed. It will ignore escape characters, backslashes, anything else. It will just print it as a raw string out to the screen. So whatever you put in there, that's what gets printed. All right. Raw strings are handy because... Um, if you're typing any kind of the string values that may have backslashes, for example, a Windows file path or uh, anything else that might cause issues. For example, here you have C colon users out desktop. Create that as a raw string. It will just accept it as it's written. Okay. When we get into pattern matching next week and we actually build out regex, you will use raw strings for that to build out your regex pattern. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. But this kind of introduces the concept of raw strings. So, so raw strings turn it in way um just makes it so you can use the backslash and doesn't it, it makes it to where it ignores all escape characters any kind of uh, apostrophe concatenate all of that it just ignores all that and prints anything between these codes so if you're going to tab raw strings you're going to have to cut the raw string off put the tab then do another raw string exactly you can't use slash t's in there or anything else because it just will print slash t okay. yep where it's really handy is if you're doing things like this with a Windows file path and you want it to actually print, 
Otherwise, you're going to have to do double slash, double slash, double slash, double slash, double slash, double slash, that kind of thing. Makes it a little more complicated just to print it out on the screen. The, uh, the your, your main use will be in regex. When we talk about that next week, it'll be in regular expression stuff. Okay, another real handy one is multi-line strings using triple quotes. So these are triple single quotes. You'll notice here that if I want this in the format that it looks like a letter from Alice to Bob, I can use triple single quotes and then format this, including spacing and, and you know anything in between here. It will print it exactly the way I have this in here. Okay, where this is handy um, with some of your uh, midterm projects, you guys might do text adventure games. In order to make those a little more fun, or if you're building something else, you could always play a little bit with ASCII art. And I always tell students to go out and play a little bit with ASCII art. So ASCII art, like for example, let's find an animal of a deer, right? And so this makes it look like a deer in ASCII, it's just a bunch of characters, et cetera. Maybe your, your text adventure games about deer hunting or something, whatever it may be. You can copy this in here, and then notice it's using single quotes, double quotes, all sorts of different ASCII characters to make it look like a deer. If we were to bring up idle, we'll do a file new. We could do something like deer equals, we'll do three single quotes, hit enter, copy and paste that directly off that website, and then do your three single quotes after that. And then at that point, all I have to do is say print deer, and it would print it. Now, this one, what you'll notice is, is as soon as it hits this other single quote, what happens here? They got three single quotes inside the actual graphic, right? So it doesn't work. What we would want to do is even set that to an R string. That should work. Let's test that. If it doesn't, we'll use triple doubles, but that's usually reserved for something else. Yep, so what you would do down here, you can use triple doubles and then that will actually allow you to print your deer out, all right? Um, now, obviously you got a little offset there um, I'm guessing because of this final slash, it thinks it's in a new line there. So you could even say an R and then run this. And there we got our actual deer. All right. So it's a, it's a nice way to add it into projects. Most of them aren't as complicated as that deer where you got to shift and do a bunch of stuff. Um, you can see they have all sorts of one. This is just one archive, ASCII art archive. Um, there's people out here. You can go out, grab a baby, throw it in there, do whatever you want to do, a pacifier, etc. cetera. Um, it's just a cool way to change your game to have a little more visuals and graphics without being an actual GUI. So those of around in the 80s when we actually played games on computers, this is all we got. This is what you can play with. And if you didn't use that triple quote thing, would it just error? Something? It would, yeah. If you tried to do it just like we did, it would end up erroring out. Um, if you just enter deer equals and then the... Just yeah, so your problem there is it won't format it correctly, right? So this is the best way to do it when you want it to actually look and format correctly exactly the way you want it. Yep. The only reason we had to use raw here was because of the this particular backslash for the tail. Okay. Um, what's also fun with the ASCII art stuff is you can also do text to ASCII art. So if I type hello world, I can also get Hello World as an ASCII art. So some people want this as the title of their project when it's starting up. You can adjust and you know change the font, do whatever you want to do. So say it's slant, it looks something like that. And if you do this, you just copy to the clipboard. You come down here to your project. And you can do something like logo or whatever you want to call it. Three single or three doubles, put it in. One, two, three, and you're good to go. And then wherever in your, what you would do is, and we'll talk about this when you get to your midterm project, but you would put these in a separate file, import them into your main project so that it doesn't get all clustered to try to see all this. And then anytime in your project, you would go ahead and print that logo. So you would keep all of these together in one area and then just call print logo whenever you wanted it to print. So that might be in your main loop or your main wall loop. You would just call print logo. 
and you'd see something like that when it gets printed out on the screen. Okay. All right. So that will get you through that. Multi-line comments. This is what you can do. So notice I printed with or uh, set it up with triple double quotes. If you do this inside of your text, say we had a whole bunch of text in here, and I'm just going to grab this line for the purposes of showing this. Right, so I'm going to bring this over here to the left. I got the font so big it might be hard to read this, so give me a second here. Here, here. Something like that. And then say we have a new line, a new line, like this, right? So if we wanted to make this a comment inside of our code, today you would have to put a hashtag instead of every one of these lines, right? Instead of doing that, what you can do is just come up above that and do a triple double quote. And then at the end, do a triple double quote. And that will turn that into a comment with multi lines inside of it. So you don't have to adjust anything inside of there. That makes sense. So before, like when you guys copy and paste your name and all that stuff at the top and you got a hashtag in front of everything, that's great. But in the midterm project, what I'll have you do is copy that up here at the top. I'm just going to put these three here for the time being. And you'll have something like INF 360, uh, Jason Zeller, midterm project. Right below this, I want a triple double quote. And inside that triple double quote, you're going to explain what your project is. So this is a text adventure game based on the game clue. I don't know. I'm making something up here, right? But this, give me a good definition of what your project is, how you came about it. If you need to um, uh, give any kind of reference to code that you may have used or, or a tutorial or I don't want you using tutorials for your midterm projects, but what I'm looking for is like, if you want to give any kind of uh, reference or like a citation to it, you can throw that in here. So you could say like, this was based off a game I used to play. The game was by Milton Bradley, something like that, et cetera, in 22, or I don't know, something like that. The idea is that inside those triple double quotes, you just give me all the information about your project. And that's a big chunk of your grade. It's like 10 points out of your grade. So you forget that you're automatically starting at a 90 for your midterm project. So it's it's worth a big chunk to give me a good explanation of what your project is. Down inside your project, if you have multi-line comments down below, you're welcome to use the triple doubles for that as opposed to putting hashtags in front of everything. The difference is, is a hashtag does one line, a triple double allows you to do as many lines inside of that as you want. Okay. Everybody got that one? This is the thing that most people leave off on their midterm project. They end up getting some of the points back on their final project because they fix it, but it's because they didn't give me the three quotes up there with whatever the definition of this project is. Okay. If you are copying and pasting text from something to put into your game, then you need it to print off multi-lines in there. Use the triple doubles to take care of that as well. Okay. So for example, and this one here is a great one, at the start of your functions, you guys have to give an explanation of what that function is. Use a triple double for that to describe what's going on. Okay. Indexing and slicing strings. All this is is that you can think of a string as a lot like a list of individual characters in there. So if you wanted to chop off pieces or pull out, you know, a slice of these different ones, you can think of a string like an index. So in this hello world example, zero is H. One is E, two is with L, L, et cetera, going all the way through. You can treat it just like you do with the list. And we looked at a little bit of that when we were doing lists. This is kind of rarely used. For example, the only thing that would be kind of useful for is say you let somebody type something in, but you only want this. So it's a password, right? But you only want it to be eight characters. Well, you can check for the length of eight, or you could just strip it down to the first eight characters. Or maybe a name, for example, in your database field, it can only be 10 characters. They typed in 400. You're going to strip it down to the first 10 characters, something like that. So to do that, what you would do is take their variable that they gave you, spam equals hello world, and then just say spam 0 to 5 or 0 to 11. 
which would get you the first 10 characters coming out of there. Make sense? There's other use cases, but it's pretty rare as to why you would do that. In and not in, just lets you treat it exactly like a list again. So we can see if the little section of hello is actually in the string hello world. Um, you could look for uppercase, lowercase, et cetera. So you can treat these in if statements that you're going through. All right. Uh, putting strings inside of other strings. This is really what you guys have already done um, in the way of doing like print statements where we say, hello, my name is, and then say name, and I am, and then string, et cetera. You can do that. And the old way of doing this, and we don't want you to do this way, all right? You could still do it where you say percent %s, percent %s, and then what that means is string, string. And then here at the end, you put a percent, and then you put a parenthesis with the values that get injected in those spots. Does that make sense? So if you look up here, it was name and the string of age. If I put name and age here, I just do a percent and do this way. Okay. This is the old Python 2 something way of doing it or early 3 way of doing it. Um, I don't tend to like this way. What you want to do is use F strings. These were introduced in 3.6. It's a whole lot easier. So now what you do is you put a little F before your string. And then inside here, you format it exactly the way you want it to look but you can do Python inside these brackets. So you do a squirrely bracket and then dump whatever variable name you want. Over here, you could dump a variable name and even add one if you wanted to. You don't have to do the long complicated strings that you guys were doing in the past. So from here on out, use F strings in order to do everything inside your projects. Trust me, it's a whole lot easier if you do it in this fashion. Okay. This one, I don't really want to see this because typically this tells me that you got the code from Python 2 and it starts to raise red flags in my eyes. It means you probably went out to the internet, found something on Stack Overflow or something else because you're going to see their stuff in this format because that was in the old Python 2 seven days. With 3.6, F-String came out. This is what they want you to use from here on out. It's much, much easier to use this side. If you don't, put in the little F in front of here, like you would with the R, you're gonna end up with a weird thing that looks like this when you print it out, right? So if you see these curly braces and the name and everything else, just know you probably forgot the F out in front of it. Once you put that in, it'll actually plug in the, the name and the age as you would expect it to. This is really helpful if you got a really long string you're trying to print out with a bunch of different variables. If you did it this way, it would drive you nuts because you wouldn't remember how to put in periods and punctuation and capitalization and all that. If you do it in this fashion, you just write it like a normal sentence, go back, put the curly braces over the stuff that you want the variables to drop in. Anybody again? It just pops it in directly as it is inside of there. Yeah, the curly braces, all that does is tell the string, hey, whatever the variable name is inside of here, do Python stuff with that. Yep. So if you wanted a dictionary, which wouldn't make sense to go inside of there, you would have to do a double thing. You would mostly just want a variable name inside of here. Yeah, it's way, way better than trying to do this stuff up here at the top, which this is just a really long string concatenation, right? Okay. The real benefit of this too is if you do it this way, remember we have age, right? If I don't convert that to a string before I print it, it throws an error, right? At least with this uh, string in interpolation, it would convert it automatically based on you doing percent %s, percent %s. Python doesn't care when you do f strings. You can put integers, floats, whatever in here. It just prints it. So no more converting, making sure you got it in the right format. Python just handles it for you there on out. Once again, another reason to use f strings from here on out. You don't have to worry about converting it to the right format. All right, anybody got any questions on that? Cool, keep cruising right along. Methods, so there's lots of cool methods you can do on strings and these are gonna make your guys' life a whole lot easier from here on out. So for example, if we have the string hello world and we wanted all of that to be converted to uppercase, then we could say spam equals spam dot upper. That's gonna convert everything to uppercase so that spam is now hello world. We could also take spam and do spam.lower, convert everything to lowercase. 
Does anybody automatically see a reason why that's awesome? Yeah. What's that? Well, you can sanitize the inputs. Yeah, right? So instead of having to have the string of uppercase yes or Y or what, you know what I mean? All the 10 different variables in between, just take their answer, convert it completely down to lowercase, and you only have to check against the lowercase option. You don't necessarily have to change their answer. So for example, you might do um, something like this. We would say something like um, my answer equals input like this, just something basic in order for us to get input in, right? And then we could say my answer if, if my answer dot lower equals equals Jason, then do something. Here, we didn't convert what they typed in to lowercase. We only did it during our check. So if I say, come back here and actually print my answer, it would not all be in lowercase. Does that make sense? We only did it in order to do the check over here. If we wanted to permanently move everything to lowercase, then we would come back here and say, my answer equals my answer dot lower. And that would permanently move whatever they typed into lowercase. Okay, what it does is keep you from having to do this. So if your question up here was something like print yes or no to continue, right? And they type in yes, instead of me having to check for capital Y, lowercase y, all caps, yes, et cetera, I just tell it to convert it to lowercase and I only have to do one check here. Otherwise, I would have to have stuff like or my answer equals equals yes, or my answer equals equals yes, et cetera, right? If I took this one out, we would have to check for all those use cases. Now you just convert the first one to lower when you do a check and it would automatically take care of it for you. Cool. Again, you do not have to have this my answer equals my answer dot lower unless you permanently want to change their answer to all lowercase. So it's helpful for a name or something else where you're trying to do a check against something. Convert it down. It takes away all their funkiness spelling and it just converts it to lowercase for one thing you need to check for. All right. You have upper, lower. You can also do a check in your if statement to see is upper means is everything uppercase, right? Is lower checks to make sure if everything they have in that string is lowercase. So if you permanently say only type in lowercase characters and you want to check to make sure they didn't have an uppercase character, you can say dot is lower, you're going to get back true or false. Cool. Much, much easier to start sanitizing things with strings now. So upper, lower, is upper, is lower. You can string these together if you absolutely choose to. So for example, I can take hello, convert everything to uppercase, then to lowercase, then back to uppercase. I don't know why you would do that, but you could do that. You could take this string, convert it to lowercase, and then do a check on it is lower, and it would come back to true, All right? Those is statements, there's a whole lot of is statements and these are gonna make your life a whole lot easier. So is upper, is lower. Ones that you guys are gonna care about is alpha is gonna make sure that they only typed in letters. So now we don't have to check if they typed in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, all the letters. We just say whatever they typed in dot is alpha. If that comes back true, they typed in just letters, no numbers. And it's not blank. So if they gave you a blank answer, that would not come back as true as well. Is alpha num is going to make sure that it has just letters and numbers, no blank space, no special characters, et cetera, just alpha numeric answers. Is decimal, this is the big one, so you don't have to do try and accepts anymore. If you type in an age, you can just say is decimal, and that's going to make sure that they typed in just a number. Therefore, you can continue on the way you were doing it. Now you don't have to do the giant try accept, convert it over, did it work, okay, do this is decimal is going to take care of all that for you, all right? Is space is going to check that it's only spaces, tabs, new lines, et cetera, not used as much. Um, is title, this is the big one I want you guys to use. Is title is going to check that the first 
character is uppercase, everything else is lowercase. Use this for names. So if any point you guys ask for a name in your project, et cetera, use is title to make sure that it is typed in with a capital letter and everything else is lowercase, all right? If they type in a full name, that works fine. It's gonna check for an uppercase character, bunch of lowercases, the next space inside of there, it's gonna look for an uppercase, then lowercase following through. So from here on out, when I sanitize or work through your guys' homework assignments, et cetera, if you guys ever ask for a name, I'm gonna to look to check to see that you used his title. I don't want you using his alpha because then they can type in lowercase characters, right? And then you guys get counted off on spelling, grammar, punctuation, et cetera. Always use his title to make sure they're typing it in in the right format. Yeah. Could we convert their name if they put in a name to a D title to check the board? Kind of, but you would have to do several steps in order to do that. So you can't convert it straight to title format. What you would have to do is then convert it to a list, change index one to whatever it was is upper, put it back in the list, then convert that list out to a string. Make them do it by just typing it correctly to begin with. <laughs> but yes, you can absolutely do that. You just have to build a little function to convert it, which is fine. I mean, you guys need functions in your project, so you can simply add that if you choose to. All right. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, like for example, if you wrote a small function to do what you were talking about, you would just simply convert this string over you would say spam zero dot is upper, and that would either return true or false to see whether or not the first character they typed was capital or not. If not, then you could take that character, say upper, and then put that back into spam zero. However, you can't just say spam zero equals blah, because this is a string, not a list. So you would have to convert this string to a list, right? Then replace that first index, then format the string, you know what I mean? Take it from a list back to a string. You'd, you'd have a whole little bit of work to do there. Totally possible though. Okay, so you have all those is statements from here on out, please use them, they are your friend. They will minimize the amount of code and headache that you have to do by quite a bit. It's amazing how much of your code is just repeat, repeat and what did the user actually mean to type in and did you get valid input? Now you can check all of that right off the bat. Okay, so that gets you through all those. You can also do starts with and ends with. So this would be another way that if you had them type in something, you could see if it starts with, for example, hello, and if that's true or false, or ends with whatever you have inside that quotes as well. So it's a great way to test and see what's inside of there. You basically get a Boolean answer of true or false out of these. Another handy one is join and split. So for example, if I have a list of different variables here. If I say comma space inside of this string, do a dot join, then it's gonna take every single one of these items inside the list, put cats and then paste this string in. Then do rats, then paste this string in. Bats and then paste this string in. That makes sense? So this is how you can make yourself a comma separated value. You could just use a space in here and it's gonna space out everything in that list. You could also say ABC, in which case it would say my ABC name, ABC is, ABC, et cetera. So you can put extra characters and stuff in there. This is really handy if you're really wanting to do the comma separated stuff. You wanna build a quick comma separated value. You could do this with a space or without a space and you would get back that value, okay? At the same time, say you have a string come in as comma-separated values. For example, you tell them to list all of their favorite baby names, right? And tell them to do it as comma-separated. They type it all in with comma-separated. You want all those baby names in a list. You would type in whatever they typed in with dot split. It's going to split by default on all the commas that they had in, or by white space, by default. You can tell it to split based off a comma, and therefore, it would take comma-separated values, dump them all into a list for you. Then you can randomly have it pick one, and it randomly picks a, something out of there. So it's a great way to get input from users as comma-separated values. They just type in something, comma, type in something, comma, or even something, space, spell something, space. You could do that. So split is really handy on chopping that up. 
Same way with just a regular sentence, like my name is Simon. If you want to get each individual chunk, you just say dot split. It takes the white space and dumps that into a list. Um, this can also be handy if we had a multi-line statement like this one here. So spam equals this multi-line comment or a string, I should say. You could tell it to chop it based on every new line character. So then what you do is a split on slash in, and you would get a list for this going through. So where would this be handy? This is handy in your guys' text adventure games. You guys are having a long paragraph that you want printed on the screen, right? It's okay to do a big multi-line comment and then tell it to print, but it just dumps it on the screen. What if you wanted it to do line by line and kind of a pause in between each line, right? Kind of fancy. So what am I talking about? Let's copy this into our example here. I have something like spam. And then down here in my project, I say print spam. And so when we run this, it just, boom, dumps it to the screen, right? Instead, what I could do is say, okay, spam dot split. We're going to split this on new line characters like this. And then for this, we want to set this to a new variable. So it would be something like um, my list equals spam dot split. Okay. Then we could say for line in my list, print line. And that would work. Now you guys are going to see it happen pretty much the same way, but notice how it kind of did it. We need to add some delay in there, right? So there's a cool module called time. Import time. And then down here, we could say print line and then say time dot sleep. And a one would do a one second pause in between that. So now it's going to look like this. Right, that's a little long and lengthy. We probably want it to be a little faster. So we could do something like 0.5. And we'd go ahead and do it that way. All right. So kind of a nice way to do lines. Can we do it by character? Yes. What would we do in order to do that? Yeah, it'd be another for loop, right? We do a for loop in the for loop. So we would say something like for line in my list and then for char in line. Now we would tell it to print char. And then sleep for 0.5. Now what's the problem there? Not. Yeah, so it's not really a break. What it's doing is, remember, a print statement by default does not add a new line character in, right? Or it does add a new line character at the end of the print. So we would say end equals nothing. And then at that point, it would go ahead and string it all together. If I could bring that up where you can see it. There you go. And we get Alice going all the way through there. Like you'd want it to go real. Now, it's not perfect because now... As it's stringing it together, look what happened. We lost all of our new line character formatting and all that kind of stuff. So we would have to tweak that. There's a way to tweak that and do that a little bit better. Um, I'll let you guys figure that out if you want to do the little typewriter thing. You would also want to set this to like 0.1, something really fast. Sometimes even 0.05 is better because then you can get it typewritten like this across the screen. You can just move your breaks and your parentheses and go. You could, you can move each one of those. So for here, you're doing this, right? What you would want to do, you're getting me to give you the answer. Is that what you're trying to do? Well, I think that's what the answer would be, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so at the end of that line, go ahead and print the new line character, and then it would go ahead and wrap to the next line. So something like that. Oh, that's cool. Couple for loops and you got exactly which one. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this was how we played video games in the 80s and early 90s. <laughs> exactly. So something like that. Again, you can make this sleep down to 0.05 if you wanted to. That'd make it look a little bit better. 
and then go all the way through. Now, one thing I ask on your homework assignments, instead of doing this time sleep 0.05 here, at the very top of your project, say speed equals 0.02, then down here, put speed in. What that allows me to do when I'm grading your homework assignments, especially for those of you that really like to make it 30 seconds between each line. I don't know why you would do that, but some of you do that. I can go in and just tweak sleep to whatever, 0.1, whatever I want it to be, and it speeds down through it for the purposes of grading. Now, when I'm actually playing your project, I leave it as you guys originally intended it. Cool. Cool. This is the pragmatic way of doing it. Instead of doing 0 0.5, 0 0.2 on every single one of those, just set some variable up here at the top. Now, there's going to be times where you want that to be a little bit different. Then go ahead and set that to be a little bit different each one or give you two different variables up here for two different times. Maybe you have intro is this and main story is going to be one second because you want it to do a block, kind of a dramatic pause in between there call this main story time and do that to one or something like that. Okay, so I don't wanna to dwell too long on that, but that's the benefit of using something like split, puts it into a list, then you guys can do the normal stuff that you're used to on a list and do for loops and such. Yeah. So our project, we're gonna make a little bit of measurement. For your project, you can do whatever you want. That is an open-ended midterm? midterm project. Okay, cool. Yep, midterm project. The only guardrails I have are the requirements on the rubric, and we'll cover that next week. Okay. So next week, I believe, is your – we'll cover that at the end of this when we get through there because I want to look through that. Okay, so we have split. We also have the ability to do partition, and partition's handy where you want to break it up at a certain point and have a tuple that has the start part, the separator of whatever you asked for it, and then the stuff after that. So sometimes if you guys are cleaning up data or sanitizing data, for example, if we had hello world, you want to break everything up on W. So it looks for the first W in your string, gives you everything before it, gives you the actual W, and then gives you the end. Then you guys can take whatever this value is and maybe do a multiple assignment in order to call it before, separate, or after, and then use that accordingly, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, so that one's handy. Justification. Hey, you guys hadn't learned center yet. We just, I was wondering why everybody kind of looked at me when I said you could just center it. They're like, what? So you can, you can justify your text inside here as well. So what you would do is hello, are just 10. What that does is it takes all the characters between the two quotes, between, there we go. It counts out 10 characters. And then anything that it needs to be in front of that, it adds white space. So hello is how many characters? Five, right? So if we say R10, that gives us five white characters. One, two, three, four, five, before the hello. If we say R just 20, now we have 15 of those up here in front. R just 20, and we have hello world. At some point, if this was five, then there would be no justification, right? because hello world is longer than five, <laughs> therefore it doesn't get justified on that side. But this is a great way for you to write a line everything when you do a printout of something going on. So if you wanna print out a table, R just is your friend. Same way with L just, if you wanna add some space afterwards, you can use L just to do that, all right? So for example, if by default, it's gonna do white space characters. If you do a comma and then whatever character you want it to do, it will use that to justify it all the way over. Again, R just is gonna add stuff to the left. L just is gonna add stuff to the right. Confusing, right? Make sure you pick that one up. You also have what's called center. And so center is again gonna take in a number and it will add white space before and after to make sure you reach the total amount. Now, what's the problem with the one you see here? Hello is how many characters again? five right we said 20 which leaves us with 15 but we divide that by two because we have two sides right Seven. one side's going to be bigger than the other and more often than not one two three four five six seven 
which means there's going to be one, two, eight. three, four, five, six, seven, eight on the back side. So usually the smaller number on the left, the bigger number on the right. Okay. If you want to use this particular character, you can use that inside quotes after that, and it will write or center this inside of here. Again, if I have this down to say four, right? Well, there's five characters in hello, therefore it's not going to add any spacing on the left or right. Anybody have any questions on center? You might want to know center. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Oh, that's on pass. Okay. All right. No center knows how center works. If I was to give you a string like this, and I said, what is the command to generate this? You would have to give me the command up here. Yes. Did you remember your microphone today? It's on my laptop. Oh, okay. All good? Um, if you give me this, note that you would have to give me the string specifically, hello, right? Because that's the only way I'm going to get the word hello out in the middle. If you just tell me center this, that's not going to give me this result. I got to have the string dot center in order to make that work. <clears throat> this is where people mess this up on the midterm exam. Okay. So practice that one, know how it works, go right in there. So to do this, to reverse engineer from this to this, what's the first thing I should do? Exactly. Count all the characters between here and here. Use your mouse cursor if it's on a screen to highlight those and count each little space as it goes through there. Once you have that number, you stick that number here. If there's any other spacing other than white, you stick that inside the little quotation here. And then whatever this is out in the middle, you stick that inside on this side. That's how you reverse engineer it. Cool? Yeah. Okay. So this little project here is a good one for you to be able to figure out how to justify things. Um, for example, in here, we have picnic items, sandwiches, four, apples, 12, cups, four, cookies, 8,000. And if we tell that to print, we can get that right aligned here. So what we did here was we added periods in order to get that to a certain spot. No matter how long the text of this stuff was, it would add the appropriate amount of periods. On the right side, we right justified everything and then added spacing in front in order to make that look right. Total, we wanted this to be 20 characters on this side, six characters on this side. Cool. Um, so you say you have a bunch of white space on the front and back for whatever thing that you're stripping out or whatever text that you want. You want to strip off the white space. Dot strip is going to take off all the white space in the front and the back. L strip is going to take everything off the left. R strip is going to take everything off the right. It's the opposite of left just and right just, right? Left just adds white space to the right. R just adds left space to the or white space to the left. When you're stripping, it's stripping on the side that's there. L strip strips it off the left. R strip strips it off the right. That's usually where most people mess up. All right. If we had a string like this and we wanted to strip out every AMPS, then we could do that and we would get back bacon, spam, eggs. Everybody see how that works? We decide to take off every AMPS, therefore that starts here. That goes away. This one would go away, et cetera, et cetera. It would strip out every space in between there. Okay. Uh, for now, what you guys have figured out is you can't figure out if A is bigger than B, right? So you know that one is bigger than two, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was a test to see if you were actually paying attention or just following along with me. So okay. two is bigger than one. If we wanted to see if A is bigger than B, what we have to do is convert that to an ORD. I can't believe I said that. That's all right. You were the only one. There were several people that chuckled on that one. You want to change that over to a Unicode, right? And so what that does is A equals 65 in Unicode, 
four is actually a 42. And what this allows you to do is convert it to a number so that you can use greater than, less than. So if we want to see if A is bigger than B or C or D or vice versa, you can convert those over to numbers using ORD. You can then reverse that back by using char. So CHR, and we do um, whatever character inside of here, it would convert it back over. So CHR 65 is going to give us an A coming back. It's a great way for you to do mathematical operations on characters such as letters, numbers, backslashes. All of those have a unique Unicode number. Uh, where would this be used the most? If you guys are ever doing serial commands, like say you wanted to do a Python script to configure a Cisco router or switch, right? And you need to send certain commands. You have to figure out if this character is bigger than the other and chop it into bytes and stuff. This is where you would use that stuff. Would you normally use it in your day-to-day -day midterm projects? Probably not, unless you're doing something where you need to figure that out. All right, last couple items here. Um, if you want to be able to interact with the clipboard for copy and paste, right? You don't want them to have to type in their address. Let them copy and paste it in. We will use a module called Piperclip. All right, so inside here, you would come up here and import Piperclip. Now, you need to pip install Piperclip. So you would have to go to the command line and say install Piperclip, right? Pip install Piperclip, and that would go ahead and install the module. Then you can use it in your project. If you do dot copy and dot paste, what dot copy will do is it will take whatever string you want to pass it and send it to the clipboard. That way I could then paste it out to something else on my screen. If I want to paste something from whatever somebody copied on the clipboard, I would use dot cop or uh, dot paste. Make sense? This is handy if you guys are trying to copy maybe URLs out of your project. So they get through somewhere in your project and you dump them out and say, here's a URL. It's been copied to your clipboard. Then you could go over, open up a Chrome tab, whatever you want to use, paste it into the tab and it works, right? Or maybe you wanted Python to generate some kind of text in a specific format. Let it do all the manipulations and such. Send it to the clipboard so you can copy and paste it into something else. Yeah. So if we're going to do something like that, do we make sure we put somewhere in there that you need to install that? With the... Yes. So at the beginning of your project, wherever I did that, there we go. You would have import Piper Clip, and then down here you would have to say, please install Piper Clip using pip install paperclip. That's what I would want to see in your project. Now, when you get to your final project, there will actually be a way to check to make sure that is installed and such. And therefore, this section would actually be part of that check. Um, for now, in the midterm project, you would just put something like this. And that's written in the, the rubric that you would have to write that in there kind of thing. Okay. Good question. So copy and paste allows you to move stuff in and out of the clipboard. You may have them copy something into Microsoft Word. You want to dump it into your Python project, go into Microsoft Word, highlight it all, control C, come into your Python project and have it run the command to do dot paste. And it would go ahead and paste it into the clipboard. Uh, let's see here. This is going to be a good project that kind of shows you how to use the clipboard side of it. Um, adding bullets to wiki markup, that kind of stuff. It's pretty handy to be able to move that stuff in and out. Join modifying lines. If you wanted to write your own pig Latin project, you could do that. So my name is Al Swigert in 4,000 years. It will go ahead and convert that over to pig Latin. Does everybody know how pig Latin works? No clue. <laughs> well, looking at this, what's it look like? So what it does is it's going to alter the string using the methods inside of here. It's going to split everything up and then add extra vowels inside of there in order to make it work. Adding the words yay or a, depending on what that prefix is in front of it. So simple little project, but it does what you're looking for. All right, that is all we have. This project is a really good one in order to learn how to use justification. 
If you guys are wanting to do something like this in your project, I encourage you to go through this table printer. This used to be a homework assignment. So before one of the other assignments I moved and kind of moved out, uh, table printer was one of those assignments. And so the idea here is that you have this table data, which is a list of lists, and you want it to print out and match this particularly, where everything in this case is right justified. You would want to figure it out. Now notice apples, Alice, and dogs is what up here? Yeah, it's the first index of each one of these lines. So you would have to tell it to go through this list, give me the first index, this list, give me the first index, this one, give me the first list, then plug that in to create a string so that you could write justify. But before I do that, I got to turn around and figure out which one of these has the longest string in it so I know what I need to justify to, right? So for example, cherries is the longest one over here. I would then have to figure out how long cherries is, then come back and adjust oranges so that it matches the total length of cherries. Apples, I needed two spaces. Orange, I needed one. Banana, I needed two. And then you would write the Python code in order to start doing that. So essentially, you would calculate the column widths to start, and then you're going to start adding that in as you go. This zombie dice game is another one that's kind of fun. People like to play with. Um, you would have to import the, the zombie dice calculator, but you can go through and figure out how he did all this in here. Okay. So big thing to take away from this week, now you have a way to finally sanitize inputs from people, make sure you got the data you want and a whole lot less code. Is title is what you wanna use for names, use is alpha, is num is gonna save you from having to do try and accepts, convert it to an integer, is it not an integer, just is num. Outside of that, Right justification, left justification, and center. Those are the main things you really need to pull out of this one. Now, with that being said, if you get to the homework assignment, again, go ahead and watch the video down here because that one's going to pretty much walk you through it. But at the end of the day, this is going to talk or go back and really work with dictionaries. So this is for you to be able to build out multiple dictionaries and send that in there. If you guys copy and paste this into Py or uh, ChatGBT, it will give you a completely different answer. And I can tell that right off the bat just by looking at it, all right? Because when I tell you to do it this way in the homework assignment in the video, and then you guys do it a totally different way inside there because I can tell what ChatGBT does and it gives me actual comments and you copy and paste that in, I'm gonna see it right away. So I'm stressing that because homework of three is the first time when people start cheating. You can't really cheat on homework assignment one and two, right? They're your own projects. There's no way to really cheat on them. You just fill in whatever it tells you to do. Give me an example of if, else, else, blah, blah, blah. This homework assignment, this is the one that's blasted out there in Chegg, My Course Hero, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, those answers are all wrong. If you're smart enough to scroll down, you'll see a comment by Professor Zeller. This answer's wrong. Don't do it in class. People still copy and paste it, all right? So please don't cheat on this homework assignment. If you watch the video, it will walk you through almost the whole thing. If you feel the urge to cheat on this assignment, don't turn it in, okay? Just don't turn it in. You will get a zero on the assignment. You will still end up with a better grade than you would if you turned it in and cheated. I, I don't know how else to tell people to do that. If you can't figure it out, turn in as much as you can, get the points that you can. Don't cheat on the last part. What people really tend to struggle with is this very last print statement, and that's because it's it's fairly complicated. I should not see any lambda x, blah, 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 4x and i loop. Yeah, right? You're like, what is he talking about? So don't use that. Because <laughs> if you get that answer out of chat GPT, that's advanced Python code. Exactly, right? Do what we did in class and the skills that you learned in class in order to answer this one. You can use exactly what we've learned in class to answer this. Essentially, you're going to end up taking a dictionary reformatting the X or the, the keys and the values, just flip-flopping them, which you guys can write a simple for loop to do that, right? Take the key, it's now the value. Take the value, it's now the key. That's all you gotta do. Because then you can turn around and sort and do all the things that it's asking you to do. The video walks you through that. So as this is recorded in this video, I'll say it again, watch the video. 
you watch, you watch the video. Thing. It makes it really easy. There you go. <laughs> and it's not so much of me trying to give away answers as it is. I want you to actually do it without cheating. If you can figure this out, your guys' midterm projects, homework, final projects are going to go a whole lot easier because you guys are going to be working with dictionaries. It's Most people will work with dictionaries. You may have some lists, but almost everything's stored in a dictionary. I've got a question. Yeah. Are you allowed to take code you've already written beforehand and reuse it? Um, from a previous homework assignment? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, cool. If you are trying to use something from another class or somewhere else, not so much. So if you were trying to build on something you kind of created in homework one to homework two and now this, that it doesn't work for homework three, right? Because no. it's very particular. Homework four is the same way. It's very yeah, particular so as what like it wants. The formatting and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all right. And stuff and you just don't feel like writing it all out. Of you account. won't be able to reuse anything in this homework assignment. No, not this one, but other ones. Yes. Yep. On your midterm projects, that kind of stuff, yes. And this one, it's very specifically I asking for one, you to. This one's a pain. Yep. This used to be one question on the midterm project or on the midterm exam. That's crazy. That didn't go over well that semester because everybody should have answered the other 35 questions on the exam because they were multiple choice. This one was at the very end. Everybody saw this one panicked and started doing the coding. It was also worth five points, just like all the other ones. Oh. Um, so most of them spent 35 minutes trying to figure out this. And then didn't have time for any other stuff. And didn't. Almost everybody failed the entire midterm exam because. So do we have a coding question on this midterm exam as well? No. No? No, you do not. <laughs> okay, cool. Everything, and we'll cover the midterm exam here next week. So I'm going to stop this recording.